Hey there, welcome to the Hot Slice Podcast. I'm your host, Jeremy White, Editor-in-Chief of Pizza Today Magazine. I am joined today by Denise Greer, who is the Executive Editor of Pizza Today. What's up, Denise? Hey, I'm doing well. How are you? (laughs) Hey, fantastic. It's a sunny day where we're at here in the Midwest, and we've got a fun guest lined up today. I'm really excited about Audrey Kelly. Oh, man. Audrey is amazing. So Audrey owns uh, Audrey Jane's Pizza Garage in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, and she's kind of a, she's a bit of a superstar in uh, in the pizzeria business, if I, if I will say. She is a rising star. You know, she's got a big, bubbly personality. I, I remember the first time I met Audrey, I was on a pizza tour of some New York City pizzerias. I think I was with you that Brooklyn. time. And yeah, you know what? I think it was your very first trip. You had just joined Pizza Today. Yeah. And I think it was your first trip. And we went on a tour of some pizzerias in Manhattan and Brooklyn. And at the time, Audrey was working in a Manhattan pizzeria. It was a Neapolitan pizzeria with a wood-burning mm-hmm. oven. And um, she made us some Roman-style pizza. I remember that. She did. We walked in and here, you know, Audrey was really young. And she's still young. She was really young at the time and just the big vibrant smile and a bubbly personality and the pizza was fantastic as well but I remember walking out of there that day thinking this girl is going to be a star she is one day going to do something pretty special absolutely you know she owns her own shop Um, she competes and does well competing Uh, she's also an ambassador for the women in pizza movement Um, so she's really at the forefront of what's happening right now she really is and you know um she's got a pretty diverse background as well because she was making neapolitan pizzas and now she's making new york style pies grandma sicilians so she's really has experimented played with dough formulas over the years and um she's just a great resource for us because of that experience that she has Oh, absolutely. And we love having her uh, write some kitchen articles for us. And we'll kind of dive right into that uh, in our in our discussion. Yeah, we definitely need to talk to her about that. She's done a really good job. She's written five or six articles for us over the past year. And I've learned a lot from what she has had to say to her peers in the pizza industry. Hey everyone, it's Katie, art director at Pizza Today, here to interrupt your podcast with a short commercial break. For over 32 years, the multi-award-winning PDQ POS system has consistently been a top-rated point-of-sale system for pizzerias, delivery, and quick service. With built-in and seamless integrations to all top-tier third-party platforms, native online ordering and rewards, contactless POS functionality, and a delivery toolkit app that enhances all aspects of delivery, PDQ POS will help your restaurant achieve sustained growth while saving time, effort, and costs. Learn more today at pdqpos.com or call 877-968-6. Six four three zero. That's eight seven seven nine six eight six four three zero. And now back to the slice. Welcome to the Hot Slice uh, podcast. Uh, our guest this week is Audrey Kelly from Audrey Jane's Pizza Garage in Boulder, Colorado. How are you doing, Audrey? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me. Oh man, we're so glad to have you on the show. So we got to say. Audrey, if you haven't read Pizza Today lately, she's one of our new writers. How's that How's that going for you, Audrey? How do you like uh, talking to the good people of Pizza Today? I absolutely love it. It's such a different creative outlet for me. Um, it's a little nerve wracking because I know I'm writing for a bunch of um, pizza people who really know their stuff. So that part of it causes a little bit of stress. But in general, it's 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 amazing. Yeah, you're killing it, Audrey. I really enjoyed your contributions. I enjoy reading them each month. I have learned a lot myself. And that's what I was going to ask you about. Do you ever, when you sit down to write the article, do you ever um, second guess yourself and say, wow, everyone who's reading this are pizza professionals as well. They've, you know, 20, 30, maybe 40 years in the business of making dough, putting together pizza. Are they going to have their own way and doubt my way and doubt my advice. D- does that any of that go through your mind when you write an article? Absolutely. Yeah. It's probably the first thing that goes through my mind. Um, 
And certain articles that I write, I definitely ask other professional opinions on it. Um, especially the one about Sicilians and grandmas. Like, I have my way of doing it. And I think, you know, it's not necessarily the correct way or it's how other people do it. So I like to get a, a variety of opinions and, you know, a little more knowledge on different subjects. Um, and also certain things I write about, I like... I change my processes a lot. So like, you know, a few months down the road, I might do something completely differently. So I try and write how I do it at the moment and really state that this is my way. It's not necessarily how other people do it. I love that though. Isn't that the beauty of pizza? Is it literally, it sounds cliche, but literally when you open up a wall, it is a blank canvas. I mean, you know, maybe <laughs> I go with red sauce, maybe I go with pesto, maybe I just go with some olive oil and garlic. Maybe I, you know, maybe I use meat, maybe I don't. It, it, you can just do literally anything you want. You can put sauerkraut on it if you want. You can do anything. Oh, you want. Jeremy, no. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> hey, I'm not Absolutely. saying I'm an advocate of a pizza and sauerkraut. <laughs> hey, I've had a Reuben pizza. I have before. tried it. It's, it's fantastic. Good. Oh, I feel like Tony used to do something like that, and it was really good. Yeah. John Gutekantz <laughs> does a really good Reuben pizza, but that's the point: is you can do, you can do anything you want. There are no limitations and throw out the old school rules, you know, throw out the rule book that it's, it's gotta be this and it's gotta be that it, it's, it's open to, to your interpretation and your creativity as a pizza chef and you can do anything you want. And it's, that's really uh, liberating. I agree. Yeah. It's one of my favorite things about pizza too. Well, Audrey, um, you know, for the folks that don't know your background, uh, you know, you, you, you've been trained really well in pizza uh, before you set out and opened your own spot. You know, what, um, uh, tell them a little bit about kind of how many styles you, you kind of got in your repertoire. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I have been trained very well. I've been very fortunate to have some really great mentors, um, so right now, I actually started out making Neapolitan pizza just to learn exactly how to make it and perfect it. And I was a little, I can say I was a little biased. Like I didn't love New York style as much as I obviously do now. Um, I think I just, I think once you get to know a style, you really appreciate it more. And once you put your own spin on it, you appreciate it more. But um, I've moved away from Neapolitan and wood fired and now... At my place, we're doing mainly New York style and Sicilian and grandma pies. You use deck ovens, correct? We have an electric deck oven. Electric yeah. deck oven. Okay. And, and what's the, uh, obviously the differences are pretty substantial, but um, from the point of view of someone who's baking the pizza on a daily basis, what are the major differences, the things you have to take into consideration um, between a wood, wood fired oven and a electric deck oven? So I guess I never really used a gas fired oven because like the high heats really drew me in and that's mm -hmm. why I loved wood fired and an electric oven kind of accomplishes the same thing. We don't get ours as hot as like 900 degrees, which a wood fired runs, but you can still like cook the pizza really fast. Um, and it cooks a little more similarly than, a than like a gas oven. Okay. What temperature do you bake at? I know you have different styles, so I'm sure there's different temperatures, but um, yeah, so kind of run us through that. About 650. And the main difference, I think, is that it's going to be a longer bake. Like a wood fired, you're going to use different ingredients in your dough. It's going to cook the dough differently, um, depending on if you're, you can also, you know, change the temperature of your wood fired. You can, you can accommodate it to your needs. Like I know not everyone who has a wood fired cooks at 900 degrees, right? Right. Yeah. So talk about your dough process a little bit. How many, how many ingredients are, are in your dough? So we use flour, water. We do a sourdough starter. We do a little bit of malt, which is like hmm. the main difference between kind of wood fired and uh, New York style, I would say, because you're adding a little sugar to your dough to help it color. Um, and then we do some sea salt and extra virgin olive oil. What does the malt do? You say it gives it color. D does it change the flavor profile any as far as you can tell? Or is it just really a thing just to help the dough look a little darker? In my experience, it's mostly just to kind of color the dough. It also, you know, helps the, the natural yeast feed a little bit more. Um, it's going to change your your fermentation process a little bit as well. What is your, uh, what is your proof process? Uh, how long, how long is that dough uh, refrigerating for? So we refrigerate it for 
Well, right now, <laughs> <laughs> summertime, <laughs> it's very busy in the summertime. Yeah. So since we do do a sourdough, it's a lot about just kind of the feel of the dough. So we're doing an initial five hour bulk fermentation. And in the winter, we leave that at room temperature. And right now we're putting it in the walk-in just because our restaurant's so hot <laughs> and the dough would just like explode. Um, and then we ball it up and leave it out for another couple hours. And then we're refrigerating it ideally one or two days, but um, we've been so busy that some day at times we're using it day of. You're talking to a sourdough aficionado here we, oh we, awesome. yeah jeremy keeps our <laughs> jeremy keeps our sourdough living right now so yeah. nice. well, you know we're excited we we decided about four years ago to elevate our process and the pizza today test kitchen um just okay. as a way to better serve our readers and one of the things we did was start our own sour it is now four and a half years old we uh we've maintained oh. it for four and a half years and it's really getting um a really fantastic flavor and i like what it does for our pizza dough when, when we make dough in the pizza today test kitchen but why did you choose to work with sourdough um what made you want to get into that because obviously as you know it takes a lot of time and attention it does yeah um it was always something that like really interested me um, I love like the science behind it and just that it's, I mean, I know all pizza dough is in a sense a living thing, but the sourdough like truly is. And I love that you can just kind of, it's really, it takes on a whole new character, I think, the dough. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not as consistent, I would say, and that's the biggest challenge of it. But because you really have to, as you know, you have to really watch your dough. Like it, it changes on an hourly basis. We're not lucky enough to have like a temperature controlled dough room. <laughs> Maybe one day. Mm -hmm. But we have these big garage doors that open. So the temperature is constantly fluctuating. So it's something that, you know, you're really having to watch the rise of the dough to know when, when to ball it, when to cool it down more. Like we add ice to our dough, especially in the summer. Um, so you have to kind of change that as well. How old is your starter? But, um, it's about the same as your guys' is actually. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, so it's still a baby, I would say. But it's also interesting just to see how much the flavor does change. Like our, our dough has gotten so much better, I think, just in the last year. Isn't that fun, though, to, to see your, your dough literally evolve? over time and literally get better and more complex as you go. And you're like, wow, I'm kind of doing it the same way I did two years ago to a large degree, but this sour is changing and it's changing the texture and the flavor of my finished crust. Yeah. It's so cool. <laughs> and yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's like every little thing fluctuates it. So, which is good and bad. Like I, I realize if like I wasn't there all the time, I probably couldn't do like a sourdough pizza. I can nerd out on this all day. How often do you feed your sour and do you ever find like, uh Oh, it's, it's out of control. It's bubbling. It's ready to go. And we're not making dough for another 12 hours. <laughs> How do you handle situations like that? Yeah. Uh, so we feed it twice a day. So we'll feed it like right before we leave at night at around nine o'clock. And then we make dough, 12, basically 12 hours later at 9 a.m. in the morning, mm -hmm. um, which seems to be working because at night the temperature is way more consistent in the restaurant just because, like, everything shut down. You know, the air conditioning is actually working. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, the starter is pretty consistent for our dough making. And then after we make the dough, we'll refeed it with a smaller amount of flour and water and then dump that out and refeed it at night. So it's like a twice-a-day process. Audrey, do you know Will Grant? I'm I do know well, yes. <laughs> so, you know, he's got a sourdough starter that's like 47 billion years old or some. 120 yes. well, well years old. Over 100 years, well over 100 years old. It, it's insane. Yeah, I actually was, I went to Italy with him last year and I was grilling him about it. <laughs> it was, you know, I feel like I always have questions about it. It's like such a learning curve. and Absolutely. What's your hydration levels like? Obviously, you know, the sour uh, is, I'm assuming yours is. 50 50 flour and water is that accurate it is yeah and then our dough without the starter is about 67 percent hydration okay so yeah. you you've got a um it's not a crazy high hydration level but it certainly um probably takes some you used to getting handling to, to handle it yeah i guess for me it just feels normal but we've definitely had other people who 
have worked in other New York places and not New York, not New York state places, but sure. New York style. Places. <laughs> um, and they are kind of, it takes them a minute to get used to it because it is a lot less stiff than some of the doughs. But I also think the hydration contributes because we're at such a high altitude. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I find that, but I know that if I like try and do somebody else's recipe here, like I always end up adding a little bit more water. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the altitude? Because you, I, when I first met you, you were actually working in a pizzeria in New York City and now you're yeah. um, <laughs> up in the mountains of Colorado. So yeah. you know, as someone who has always lived in, uh, in the Midwest and, and never lived at altitude, does altitude really impact your process that much? And, and how so? I People ask me this all the time, and I probably should research and know the answer to it. But like, <laughs> I grew up in, in this town, and it's always just been normal for me. You know what I mean? Yeah, sure. And so I guess like whenever I bake, I've always done a certain recipe. And of course, in New York, it was different. Um, I've changed my dough process so much since opening my place that I can't quite compare it to when I was in New York. Mm-hmm. I think even more than the altitude, it's like the humidity factor because the East Coast is so humid. Like I think that adds extra moisture to the dough without adding actual water. That makes sense. But I don't unfortunately have a scientific answer. (laughs) (laughs) But I should because I do get asked it all the time. Like, well, how do you change your dough for the altitude? And I'm like, I don't know. I just make it. I don't know. I just make it the way I make it and it turns out. I, I dig it. Hey, the yeah. the million dollar question is, how many people have their hands in your dough making process? Because, uh, you know, I, I hear people that are like, nobody touched my dough but myself or somebody else. Uh, you know, who's uh, who, who's touching your, your dough making? So it's me and I have one other person who does it. Um, and he he's gotten really good. Like, he's great at making it. And then my husband, actually, he used to make it and then he kind of stopped working at the restaurant for a while and now he's relearning it. <laughs> So three, I guess you could say three of us, but I used to be the only one who did it. And then I, like, you kind of get to a point where like, you can't do it all. And, you know, if I, like last year I was traveling a bunch, so it was necessary to have, you know, you have to have someone making the dough if you're not there. Yeah. You make dough once a day, twice a day. How many dough balls on a typical day are you making? Um, So we make it once a day just because of our process, like the bulk ferment and then the extra rise when it's already in the balls outside of the walk-in takes about 10 hours. So um, we are making right now about 200 pounds of flour. So that's wow. about 300 and what, 80 pounds of dough right around there. Yeah. Now we keep hearing that um, right now it's like Super Bowl every Friday, <laughs> Super Bowl every Saturday. You know, how are you guys adjusting to kind of – being on so much and just cranking it out so hard the beginning was definitely rough like it took a little um acclimation to being so busy but luckily i I have a really good team um at first we thought it was going to be you know we didn't know what was happening so at first we thought oh my god we're going to be completely quiet we kind of like pared down the staff and it was a shift because we used to have really, really busy lunches, like a line out the door, slice salads, you know, and we'd have four people there. Um, and then the nights would be busy as well, but it's just, it's a different busyness because it's mostly to go pies. And it kind of shifted that we didn't really have a lunch because, you know, there's no workers and or nobody going to their office and no one out and about. And we'd get a lot of to-go pies in during the day, but we shifted. <laughs> At first, it was just like me and Jose, my my manager, who was there. And then I like added another person, and now we almost need like five people during the day, just like prepping. Oh wow! And getting ready for the night, and we have some of the lunch business back now too. Are you still doing your Sicilian and uh, Grandma right now? We are, yeah. Um, the Sicilians. That's been a a shift as well. The grandma, which we call our patty with the sesame crust, has become like super popular. And I know it looks really really good. I really want one. (laughs) Well, whenever you're in Boulder, I will make you one. Yeah. Over the last few years, I have become a really big fan of of the grandma. Um, It's just it's so simple, but there's so much flavor and perfection in that simplicity that it it really appeals to me right now. Do you find yourself having to educate your customers on what a grandma pizza is? Do they ask you why you call it a grandma 
or they think it's just named after your grandma personally? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we people definitely they don't quite get it here. Like there's certain people who know what it is and they they seek it out. And then other people I think just really have had it or they've had it or heard about it and they love it because of just trying it. Um, so yes, the education is key. I feel like my biggest frustration is when people say they just want like the deep dish one and <laughs> we don't serve deep dish pizza, which nothing against deep dish. It's fantastic. It's just like, first of all, I have never made it. So I don't claim to know how to make deep dish. And second of all, like it's a Sicilian or a grandma. It's not anything like it. Um, but this, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's been a shift lately. The grandma has definitely had a lot more requests for it and it really holds up our line when we make it. Cause we've been, we, uh, we cook them. We don't do a par bake on our grandmas. So it kind of takes a little bit longer for them to cook. So we've been kind of reworking it to figure out how, to, how to make more of them and how to not make them take as long. So we're basically, we're par baking the grandmas now. Hey everyone, it's Katie, Art Director at Pizza Today, here to interrupt your podcast with a short commercial break. Performance Food Service is proud to deliver high-quality products, innovative technology, and custom operational solutions to restaurants of all sizes across the country. The flagship division of Performance Food Group, with deep roots in the restaurant industry, Performance Food Service has been the exclusive distributor of the Roma family of brands for more than 65 years. This signature relationship has allowed Performance Food Service to become a leader in the pizza and Italian segment of food service nationwide. Your friends at Message on Hold are happy to introduce our voiceover IP service. Message on Hold Phones is our solution for phone service. If the internet goes down, it's no problem. You can still take online and phone orders. No busy signal ever. Professionally recorded, customized messaging for your business ensures that your customer gets the message that you want delivered to them every time. Save money and get new phones. Visit www.messageonholdservice.com phones. And now back to the slice. I got you. I was going to ask what it, how it contributes to your menu mix. Is it, you know, 30% of pizza sales, 50%, 80%, 10%? No, <laughs> it's probably like 10%. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The New York is the biggest seller for sure. Have you reopened for dine-in yet? No, no, okay. we're not, we're not going to. Oh, okay. That um, has, has the state of Colorado opened up and you've just chosen not to, or is it still completely shut down everywhere? Uh, places are reopening. There's a lot of outdoor seating. Um, we just, we have such a small dining room. It doesn't really make sense for us. We also have turned it into a storage area. Okay. <laughs> so, so that's your new business model going forward. Delivering for out only. We're going to, we're going to see what happens in the fall. Okay. How, how are you doing delivery? Do you, we'll see do you have go your ahead. own delivery staff? Um, or do you go through third parties or how, how do you, how do you handle that? We do third party. Yeah. We've tried to do delivery ourselves and we just, we can't, ha before this all happened, we couldn't um, seem to hire any drivers. <laughs> it was, I mean, in my mind, a lot of the drivers get taken up by the third party system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's like, A, they're getting probably paid more than we could pay them and they can do multiple places at once. I don't know. I've never done delivery before, so it always kind of scared me. And then just the fact of like, we couldn't find drivers. It just, we just never did it. Does it scare you to know that you've lost control of your quality control once it leaves your hands and goes into a third party's hands? Does that, is that anything that ever weighs on you? Have you ever had any problems with that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's like, probably the source of our biggest complaints are third party delivery people. Um, but it's also, I don't know. I don't really see a way around it right now. Like they've kind of taken over the delivery system. Um, and I would say the majority of our customers pick up the pizza. So I feel like if people, I think that's, I don't know. We always encourage pickup. Oh, yeah. Do you want, yeah. you market to that? Do you try to get the word out? Hey, come, come pick your pizza up. Um, is that part of your advertising campaign budget or do you just, uh, you just open the doors and that's just kind of how the flow works out? <laughs> yeah. We don't really have an advertising budget. We don't really advertise at all. Um, but yes, we encourage people to pick up. We have like a online ordering system and the majority of the people kind of just order online and pick up now. 
So it's, it's worked out so far for us. With your takeout, uh, did I hear you say that you are offering slices right now? We are, yeah. And how's that going for you? Um, yeah. It's gotten busier. At first, we were offering like you know cheese and pepperoni, and it's it's definitely picked up. People definitely want slices. I can say that. Like the nights during the night, we kind of take them away because it just gets too chaotic to pump mm-hmm. out that many pizzas and do slices. But during the day, like that was our main business was slices and salads. So it's hard to like take that away from people. Yeah, we were having a conversation with Scott Sandler out of Pizza Head and oh, his yeah. business what, you know, is very strong slices and that's what he was kind of saying is, you know, slices is, you know, the whole pies are working at night. So, it's hard to go hard to go back, but it sounds like um your balance of being able to do slices during the day and then removing that. Do you have any challenges from people that are like, "Hey, I need my slices at night too?" or are they just kind of on board with uh with how your process is working they definitely want slices at night um and we make we try and like fill the slice case and then once we run out we kind of just run out but i i don't know i guess i just you know when there's a line wrapped around the block and people are and we're like all frantically moving as fast as we can i I just find it hard that people are like asking (laughs) like or you know what i mean like yeah I, I, I would hope that people would be a little more socially aware to see that we're doing the best we can in this time. And slices take up a lot of room in your oven, man. Slices take up a lot of room. Uh, they take up a lot of room and just like a whole nother person just, you know, getting the slice out of them. Just like reheating it and wrapping it and calling it out. Whereas that person could be like cutting 10 pizzas in the time they do that. You know what I mean? Oh, it's wow. Just, it's like a whole extra body of preparing this I don't know but we've actually before all this happened we kind of like we got a new oven so we took away a little bit of the dining area and we were contemplating putting in a whole a different smaller oven just for slices um and maybe once everything's open back up or maybe we will end up doing that just because then it takes some of the pressure off of the the oven person you know doing slices and whatnot yeah we've seen a couple of folks do that and we've actually seen um People uh, have an entire um, oven area just for takeout, too. Um, so we, we've seen people do a lot of different ways just to anything to make things efficient and effective for your operation. Totally. So I feel like you it sounds like you are definitely dialing in on trying to uh, speed up your processes and make everything as fluid as possible. Yeah, I think that the main thing, as I'm sure every other operator knows, is just like finding the people to to work those stations. So like we have our main core group of people, but it's just, yeah, there's like tons of people out of work. But in Boulder, I've heard like people are making just as much off of unemployment as they are like working their old jobs. So it's hard finding like quality people, I guess. So are you fully staffed right now? Do you have the people you need to do? Uh, yeah, we're we're definitely fully staffed. We've even hired a few extra people. So we we'd actually never let anyone really go. Yeah, the pandemic, which sounds pretty normal in the pizza industry at the moment. Well, at least for slice houses or to go. Yeah, what's your culture like? Like, what's the vibe and working at uh, working at Audrey Jane's? I would say the pretty much everyone are like everyone's friends. Um, they all hang out together. I'd say it's pretty relaxed until it gets busy. (laughs) And then everyone works really well as a team though. That's definitely a requirement. Like we've had a few people who don't work out just because like they can't work well with the others. Mm -hmm. It's a very tight knit group of people. Probably because we're so small too, you know, it's everyone's working in one area together. How many, uh, how many staff members do you have? We have about 15 total, um, we never have more than like eight of us there at a time, which is actually, we never used to have more than like six people there at a time. And but now it's how long have you guys been open? You guys have been open for uh, four, five, years. five years. I was going to say four or five years. Um, you know, do you do anything um, special as far as, you know, incentivizing them or, um, you know, offering benefits and things? Um, so we're just this year starting to offer benefits to full-time people or last year, I guess we started. Um, we don't, that being said, like we don't really have a lot of full-time, like I have, I think three full-time people out of all those people. Mm -hmm. 
So most of them are, I'd say half of them are college kids. So they kind of cycle in and out. Like they'll be here during the school year or they'll, or vice versa, they'll be here during the summer because they live here, which works out well for us because they kind of swap out. Yeah. Know? Like they go away to school, then they'll be here for the summer. And the ones who go to school here, <laughs> then they come back. And then the other half actually, they work at our bagel stores and then come and work for at our at the pizza place at night. Um, Wait, you said bagel store? Yeah, yeah bagel no, like, store. Tell like, us about um, that. I, yeah, I, I, had no idea yeah. You had a bagel I raised my eyebrows like, hmm, bagels? Yeah, I, I had no yeah. clue. Yeah. <laughs> so some of my best guys, they are like, they do all the production at our bagel shops in the morning and then they come and like make pizza at night, which works out really well. Um, as far as in- incentivizing, we, I mean, we give them year end bonuses, the people who, you know, our main people. We just gave everyone a pretty big bonus during the whole situation. Um, we do tips. Everyone just splits tips, except for like, you know, me or my husband or my brother. We don't take tips, but everyone else just splits the tips evenly. Um, yeah, I guess yeah. that's... Now you, that's, because, you know, it is uh, your husband and your brother. Um, tell us about how that kind of works. Are you kind of the hands-on person and, and then there's just kind of on the backseat or are they also in the shop? you know, every day, uh, you know, what kind of roles do they have as well? Yeah. Um, my husband, when he's there, he's definitely in the shop, making pizza, making dough, doing all that stuff. My brother is more of the business role. So he's, um, it's always good to have that guy. (laughs) Yes, definitely. (laughs) I'm terrible at that. So it, it balances out really well. Like I do kind of the creative day-to-day stuff and he does all of the the money stuff. (laughs) Which works out too because you know it's hard to work with family. So generally yeah. speaking, the person who has their hands in the dough and loves to make the food doesn't necessarily always become the best option for handling the money in a business. So it's it's good to have that without question. Absolutely. And I think it's good to, you know, acknowledge your weaknesses. Like not everyone is good at everything, <laughs> at least in my mind. Right. Um, well, one thing we know you're good at, Audrey, to switch gears is making pizza and We've got you lined up at the Pizza Pasta Northeast show in Atlantic City this year to do a couple of food demonstrations. I think you're oh, doing yeah. a Sicilian and Grandma yep. <laughs> demo and a simple topping combination. So I know that's still a few months out. You probably haven't really worked too diligently on, on what you're going to prepare. But what are you thinking? Uh, <laughs> what are you thinking you're going to do out here in Atlantic City? Well, I definitely am thinking about how to do my grandmas and Sicilians because we do have like a long process of rising. So I think I'm going to keep those pretty simple and just focus on the techniques on the grandmas and Sicilians. Mm -hmm. Um, As for the toppings, I think really kind of just focusing on different cheeses and meats and veggies and like which ones pair well and kind of like the different flavor profiles and textures and how to get how to like accomplish a cohesive pizza out of different ingredients do you have any rules of thumb you like to abide by for example um i don't like to put more than four toppings on a pizza or two toppings or eight toppings or whatever that number is is there at what point does it become too much like when a customer wants i want pepperoni sausage bacon pineapple jalapeno (laughs) green peppers black olive and then they they just yeah. get out of control and they're up to like 18 toppings. Do you ever just, at what point do you say, wow, this is not going to work? I mean, I'm pretty, I say it pretty quickly. I'm not huge on like loading up pizzas. Mm-hmm. Mostly because like our dough isn't, it's not like a super crunchy dough. So it gets soggy if you add like a thousand toppings. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't have green pepper, pineapple, or black olives. So that takes away some of wow. that. <laughs> um, no green pepper. We, that's unique. No. I just, I mean, I, I'm sure there will be a thousand people who disagree with this, but I don't think it really has any flavor. <laughs> I don't think it adds anything. Um, yeah, roast, roasted, red, roasted red peppers. <laughs> I mean, we don't have that, but I do love them. So okay. <laughs> <laughs> Now, um, the no pineapple, is that because you're in the camp that says it's a mortal sin to put pineapple on a pizza, or are there other reasons for that? Um, I I mean, if people want pineapple, they can have it. I just, I don't, I really like to focus on, like, fresh ingredients, and most pineapple, like, I know you can get a fresh pineapple, but... That's a lot of work. Unless you're really, it's a lot of work, it's a lot of waste. Um, I just, like, unless I created, like, a special pizza for it, I don't think I'd I'd have it. 
So that's, I mean, I, I'm not against pineapple. I'm not gonna Makes take sense. A you know, one of my favorite <laughs> topping combinations. <laughs> yeah, one of my favorite topping combinations is like a really spicy soprasada with pineapple oh, yeah. jalapeno and like some hot honey. That's, um, okay, well, that, sounds good. that speaks yeah. to my soul. So, you know, when people like are ready to, to wage World War III over whether or not <laughs> pineapple should be on a pizza menu, I'm like, hey, you know, anchovies have been on pizza menus from, you know, but they're so good. Anchovies. <laughs> See, that's where I I can't do. I, they're too salty for me. I can't do the anchovies. Okay, I don't well, mind. I, I've come a, I've come a long way with anchovies. Like uh, now, when I get a Caesar salad, like they have to be in there. And on pizza, yeah. I have had them. And even like I'll, I've they're come good. around to olives too. Like I used to not because I did not like I didn't really like salty things. So to have olives, I didn't know that there was anything but those little black ones in the can that taste like nothing. Yeah, uh, See, we do Castle Volcano. <laughs> so we have olives, and I feel like they're like. You know, they're very mild green olives. I think it's just the color that throws people off. Yeah, I'm all about the green olives. I think they have more flavor personally. Now, my wife disagrees. Mm -hmm. She loves the black yeah. olives on pizza, but um, give me the green. Yeah. Jeremy, have you ever been to Italy? You know, I have. I've been to uh, northern Italy a few times, Parma, Venice. Um, uh -huh. Because that's what really changed anchovies for me. Like, I was always a little skeptical, but when you have them there and they're fresh and they're it's just like the best thing. And I think you'd like slowly work your way into like the really salty ones. That makes sense. You know, the thing that um, my first time over at Parma, the thing that really opened my eyes was I had a lot of really fantastic pasta dishes, specifically ravioli that were, that had pumpkin. And Ooh, yeah. I was like, wow, I, I, you know, growing up in the Midwest, pumpkin is a Halloween thing, pumpkin pie at Thanksgiving. <laughs> Uh, I, I never had pumpkin used in that manner, and I yeah. absolutely loved it. So you could definitely have your eyes opened when you when you travel and, and experience new things. And maybe maybe one of these days you guys will convert me to an anchoviest. But right now, yeah. uh, right now, no, give me the pineapple instead. That's fair. <laughs> you know, speak. Well, going back to the, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, 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 go ahead. You said you're going to oh, go back I to something. Say, absolutely. Going back to like the loaded toppings, we. Yeah, we definitely do not have a supreme. My my husband actually has an ongoing joke that we should call like, do a really fancy cheese pizza and call it our supreme, and then people will be <laughs> I like it. <laughs> very um, nice. Yeah, which I know is just kind of mean though, because so many people love their supreme pies. <laughs> yeah. Now you are a competitor. I mean, you uh, you know with the uh, international pizza challenge and uh, the competition in Italy, you, um, you know, you, you are out there in the forefront of pizza. <laughs> well, I guess, I guess. <laughs> it's a, yeah. It's, it's an interesting thing. Cause I'm like very competitive with myself. So like if something goes wrong, like I'm just so hard on myself that every time I'm like, well, maybe I just won't compete anymore. And then of course, the next competition comes, and I'm like, "Well, I just have to enter now." <laughs> yeah. What are you it's taking away like from these? You know, what uh, are you coming back to your shop like? Oh my gosh, we we can grow in this. You know, I went to Italy, and and I see so much that you know we could do differently, or that we can learn from or grow from. Absolutely, yeah. That's one of the hugest things from competitions is not only are you learning from the different places that you see, but you learn so much from the people you're around. Like the other competitors, you see things, you learn things, you're just talking to everyone. I mean, that's one of my favorite things about the pizza business is that like I'm constantly learning from all of my, all of my other people around me. Yeah. And I think, I think you're a real inspiration to a lot of those other folks competing. <laughs> Well, I say that as yeah. you, you know, you went from working in a kitchen to owning your own pizzeria. Some, some folks like that's their end goal and you're there. Um, oh, you. you know what I mean? So it like, was, yeah, I mean, that was kind of always my goal. Like I always knew I wanted my own place. So, so how, you know, for, for especially those listening that, um, that don't quite open, have a shop yet, um, you know, what it, what do you think your best advice to them would be um, for, you know, that that jump, that transition? Just just do it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, at some point you do have to just do it. I think the number one thing is to really have like a clear vision of what you want and really be committed to it because it's not easy. 
like I think going into it, you have all these ideas and these fantasies of how great it's going to be. Um, and it is like, there's definitely so much reward with it, but the day to day is really challenging. Like it's still challenging for me. I think, I think a lot of people like look at everyone's Instagrams and social media these days and they're like, Oh, well that's fun. And (laughs) that's beautiful. And this is just like, you know, all of these cake, and really it's not like this, like last, the last two weeks our walk-in's been down and like three nights in a a row at 10 o'clock at night, we're like hauling all of everything out of the walk-in, you know? Yeah, like it's hard to it in the morning. I, I think people don't see that side if they've never worked. I think a lot of people nowadays like don't even work in a restaurant and then they go to owning one. Um, and it's a little bit of a disconnect because there's a lot of moving pieces. Absolutely, no, you're right. It's a lot of hard work. It's it's down and dirty and grimy and gritty. And people see the beautiful food shot on Instagram and and the the romantic side of it but they don't see the scrubbing toilets and scrubbing floors but part of it. <laughs> yeah and i also think another huge thing for me is that i have a really good support system like my whole family's here my husband's willing to pitch in you know if something's wrong like if you know if the drain goes out like it's my dad down there snaking the drain for me which <laughs> I love that I, like I know not everyone's lucky enough to have like a family surrounding him but like have people that you can call like to this day I'm still calling Tony to ask advice and you know like I think it's important to have somebody that you can rely on to like help you out because you're never going to have the answers to everything like I don't ever expect to absolutely well said well- man that's just like it awesome uh point to end on i think she i mean she just <laughs> wrapped up everything in one sentence <laughs> yeah, this has been a great conversation i know we we kept you a little longer than we told you we would no, so. thanks so much for having me it's always great to talk to you guys yeah especially we, since i missed you at pizza expo I know, I know i know i've got a great big hug for you in atlantic city though okay yeah. <laughs> i don't know if know, we're gonna be allowed to hug in atlantic yeah there's gonna be so me, distancing. i might have to give you an air <laughs> high five from six feet away i don't know We'll make it work. Yeah, we'll, we'll make I'll, it work. I'll, 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 I'll blow you a, a kiss and a hug from six feet away, I guess. I don't know. Perfect. Yeah. I can't wait. <laughs> well, we can't wait to see you in October. Um, I know. I'm so stoked. Yeah. Thanks and- for having me, you guys. And... I guess I'll see you then. Sounds <laughs> Absolutely. Great. Thanks, Sounds Harry. great. Yeah, thank we'll you so it. much. Thanks for joining us this week on The Hot Slice. Special thanks to Audrey Kelly for talking with us. Next week, we sit down with Rocky Shanauer. Make sure to visit pizzatoday.com and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts so you'll never miss an episode. And while you're at it, rate us and review us and share the episode. Thanks for listening to The Hot Slice. We'll see you next week.